thank you all for coming. It's a, a talk we've entitled The Art of Rehearsing. Um, but actually, this is, um, in a larger sense, the art of collaboration. Because all of music is a collaboration. Even if you're playing a piece of solo music, you're collaborating with the composer. Uh, but anytime you add more than one person, you have to figure out how to work collaboratively to bring out the very best in each other and in the music. This is a really, really important process. It's one that we've, I think we've built this Bowdoin Festival around. Um, Dave and I have been the artistic directors for the last three years, but in the 50 years before uh, we took over artistic directorship, I think one of, one of the qualities that made the Bowdoin Festival so special is this supportive, intimate, and collaborative kind of, of atmosphere. Um, your ability to do that successfully will matter. I'm hesitating because I don't want to say more than your ability to play in tune with a beautiful tone. Those are really important. But your ability to be a, uh, a wonderful collaborative musician and human being, uh, I think you'll find in your careers will make a big difference uh, to the kinds of opportunities that you enjoy and, and the, the satisfaction and fulfillment that you get uh, from your music making. Um, let me just pause to acknowledge the, the, the people who are here in the audience. So I, I know that um, we have participants. Um, another quality of the Bowdoin Festival that Dave and I particularly love is the fact that we have musicians age 13 all the way up to 29. Um, as a community, our ability to mutually inspire and learn from each other, whether you're at, at the beginning stages of your musical careers or whether you're just about um, to you know, launch into a, a you know, true profession. Uh, we're all in this together and there's something for all of us to learn. Uh, this idea of collaboration and rehearsing, uh, we might cover some things here that seem basic. We might talk about intonation at a certain point and you think, oh, that's really basic. But on the other hand, you never um, become too good at certain things. You know, if you play in the NBA, you never become too good at shooting free throws. Sometimes the outcome of the game depends on you making your free throws, one of the most basic things there is. Um, as a musician, if you're still able to do the basics and do them extremely well, um, the better you will be. Um, I know we also have some community people um, who are interested, and we welcome you, whether you're musicians or not. I know that every once in a while, our quartet is asked to do open rehearsals. I think there's a lot of interest, and this is now for you musicians, a lot of interest in people who are not musicians about the creative process, what goes on. And we even hear that, uh, you know, like sometimes we get a little shy. We're like, well, the kinds of things that go in rehearsal, I don't know if it's appropriate. You know, sometimes things get a little heated. And then we always get the, uh, the answer from whoever the presenter is like, well, actually our audience likes it best when the, when the ensembles fight. So <laughs> this idea of, of having a creative process that, process that is open and honest, I think means a lot. And that's also um, what we're here to talk about. That's where we're gonna end our talk is um, the interpersonal skills and the communication skills that really make a difference so that it is not just about being a great musician, but it's also about being a great human being. But I wanted to start our talk. Uh, we're gonna cover four basic areas uh, in this hour. Um, I'd like to start the talk on rhythm, um, and then we're gonna talk about um, matching, cohesiveness, that'll include uh, intonation, articulation, tone colors, all of that, figure out how to be cohesive as an ensemble. Um, then we're also gonna talk about score reading and interpretation, and then finally we're gonna end up um, with that the area that maybe makes the most difference in the end is your interpersonal skills, uh, the, the way that you communicate with one another, the way you respect one another, um, and signal that respect and, and value for your fellow <laughs> human being. Um, that's a lot. So let's go right into rhythm. Uh, I want to start the talk on rhythm. Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to start the talk on rhythm uh, with two very brief stories from our quartet's career. 
Um, one is very early on, when we were still a student quartet, very ambitious, we had a chance to go study at the Aspen Quartet, Advanced Quartet Institute. I think that's what it's called. It has some fancy title. Um, and we got a chance to play for the Emerson Quartet in a public master class as part of that institute. Um, we played, I think it was WC, String Quartet. Really intense, we'd worked on it hard. And one of them came up and they had found a hat backstage. And they said, okay everyone, the first thing we're gonna do this after our performance is we're gonna pass around this hat, we're gonna take a collection from the audience because the Yings need a metronome. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, <laughs> right? Okay, that was at the beginning of our career. And then, the, um, <laughs> and then the, another story that I wanted to share with you guys is um, much later on, it was actually about uh, 10 years ago now, uh, we dreamed up a collaborative project between our quartet and the Turtle Island Quartet. Some of you may be fans of the Turtle Island Quartet, uh, and you know that they focus on jazz. We start, we, they wrote us some music to play together, um, and many of you may have explored this because musical boundaries are seeming to disappear, uh, but this whole idea between groove music and not groove music, and their music is groove music, which fits into an absolute musical grid. The music that we study, Beethoven, Schubert, Mendelssohn, is absolutely not groove music because you're always talking about the ebb and flow and rubato of music and the way phrases end, the way you breathe, the way you begin the next phrase, completely the opposite. And so we're trying to enter their world and play steadily um, using a metronome. And we're working, working, working. And it was actually a very frustrating process for my group because you know, we'd work on it, work on it, work on it, and then we'd play it. And they just keep shaking their heads. It's not steady. It's not steady. And we were doing our very best to play steadily. And it was something that was so difficult for us coming from a world where everything is, is flexible. Um, and so that's just, those two stories are just, um, to set up this idea that a as musicians, one of your very first priorities um, is rhythm. I mention that because it took me a long time to get there. There are so many other things. I'll just talk about string instruments in particular. I know there are other instrumentalists, pianists here. Um, but w where do we start with the instrument? How do you hold it? Is your bow straight? Um, intonation, vibrato. Tone color, tone, tone production, weight, uh, you know, playing in your core. There are like so many things to think about which you should think about that suddenly rhythm is just like, okay, I basically do rhythm. But you don't really think about it and you don't really work on it. And I suggest to you um, that it is, if it's not a priority in your mind, that along with everything else that you want to think about, all the good things, that you really make it a priority. Um, and the analogy is really simple is when you build a building, what do you start with? You start with a foundation. You start with the structure. When you have a body, what do you start with? You start with a skeleton. And no matter how aesthetically beautiful you want to make the exterior, all the details that you want to put on the exterior, or all the you know, um, appearances, clothes, and all of that that you worry about, if, <laughs> if the, the structure is not wonderfully straight, and well constructed, if the bone structure is not there, it's really difficult to accomplish what, what you want. Um, so, rhythm. Uh, it does start with the metronome, but it goes way beyond the metronome. But the metronome is a very helpful tool. And one practical suggestion for all of you, as you prepare your parts even before the first rehearsal, figure out a basic metronome mark. It may not be exactly what you end up with, but figure out a basic metronome mark and practice your part at least sometimes with the metronome. And I can tell you that even from the first rehearsal, it will go much more smoothly. If everyone knows that the easy parts, don't skip the easy parts because you have to know how long that, that, that you know, whole note lasts and what it feels like to play it. Uh, but especially the more difficult parts that you know you can already play it steadily at a certain metronome mark so that you're not, wobble you're not individually wobbling around because you'll never find each other. It'll just be frustrating. So that saves a lot of time from that first rehearsal. And then from the first rehearsal to the second rehearsal, then you know about what tempo you guys are coalescing around in between rehearsals. Make sure you practice with a metronome at least sometimes. Um, so that you are figuring out, like I said, all those, especially all those technical parts, 
it will go together much more smoothly if you can do that as an individual. Um, on the other hand, so the metronome is a really good tool. Um, <laughs> I, I've had other um, older chamber musicians say that the metronome can also be used uh, effectively as a weapon against your colleagues and to <laughs> embarrass them in rehearsal, so we'll leave that out. But anyway, <laughs> there are certain things that a metronome can't do. Um, one is a metronome obviously can't help you with that flexibility of tempo. The other thing a metronome is unable to do is communicate to you anything about the character of the music. Because whatever click noise you choose, that's it. Sure, it gives you absolute steadiness, but it doesn't give you the proper structure, the proper bones of a piece of music. And I'll just give you two examples of this. The Prokofiev Quartet that we played last night. If we were to, uh, the opening four bars of it, we're just looking at it and we say, okay, Allegro Sestinudo, Forte, 4-4, four, four. here we go. Yes, we did it. Okay, now let's go on. We're pretty together, good tone. We happen to play pretty well in tune, I think. So, okay, check, did it. But we're missing a lot by not considering the character of the rhythm. Click, 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 click. I think we're pretty good at that, actually. Um, but it should go way beyond this. Um, is this, should it just be like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's about how we played it. I would say absolutely not, we're missing a lot. We'd have a discussion. What do you think the character of this is? And I think we'd come to, what well, we have come to, it's exuberant, it's, it's um, joyful, it's uplifting. There's a lot of open strings in there, um, which adds to the resonance. So we say, what would you, what would you do with the, the pulse in order to reflect the character? Well, you probably wouldn't count it one, two, three, four. You would count it like you just got the best piece of news you ever got, or someone just gave you a winning lottery ticket. One, two, three, four, one. So let's just do that. If each of us is individually counting one, two, three, four with much more exuberance, what does that do to the music? Okay. Um, let me take it a few more steps. Um, something that immediately changes when you go after the character of the pulse is that the cueing and the breathing changes. We mostly look at first violin if there's a, a general cue, but it's important that we all cue and that we all cue in the character. So let's cue it um, in the, just the one, two, three, four. And what does that look like? And now let's cue it in. One, two, three, four. the unanimous unanimity of the of the of the cue right and not to interrupt but uh it's not just my job to cue to cue it, it's it, cueing is almost always just a breath of some sort a breath in character and if i'm the only one doing it you can also see what happens if, if that's the case <laughs> it might be able to play together, but it even, it feels awkward for me. If I don't get anything from them, um, they might feel like they have uninteresting parts. So they don't feel like, oh, I don't need to lead it, or something like that. But if I don't get the same thing that I'm giving, then it feels out of balance. So we all breathe together, even if I initiate. So I might add one further thought, that the idea of cueing is not for other people fundamentally. It's to get myself ready to play. And if the reason why breathing is such a fantastic way to cue is because it literally energizes my body. If you want to calm down, you're too hyped up, everyone says, take a deep breath, right? Breathing has such a way of energizing your body in the way you want it to be energized. So I'm, if I'm thinking joyous, I want to breathe in a joyous way. If I'm thinking Allegro 104, I want to breathe in 104, right? And when I energize myself to play in that way, they'll know how I'm going to play, besides me. And then that's that sense of communication between us. Uh, so it's really important, even though Robin may be initiating the cue, that we're all energizing ourselves to play and feel
feeling each other's energy as a result. All right, let's go a little further. Let's go to the uh, slow movement. Uh, I was going to say oh. one more thing. The, oh. the other thing is that, um, like he was saying, rhythm often has some flexibility. And as long as you're basing that flexibility on what the music seems to be asking for, um, it can make very good sense. Um, in this case, because three of them have a part that goes something like a, two, three. I think there's a special emphasis on the fourth beat, which is a sort of unusual thing in 4-4. Four, four. Um, and to me, it makes an imbalance, a, 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 a very good imbalance. Good imbalance. Um, so I wouldn't play my part. But... Uh, change the way I play my part, even though I can't see that here. Um, because and besides yeah. cueing, we're counting, so those two things totally go together. And when I'm counting, as Phil said, we're not counting like the metronome, one, two, three, four. But because the harmonies change on four and one, one, two, three, four, one, two, and Robin feels that kind of counting from us, and thus affects the way he plays his and also I have, and, and those are my variations, and I can either choose to play them exact and literal, or I could make them fun in some way. Um, so, yeah. the metronome can't do for you. Um, all right, let's go to a, a slower music and just take it uh, a couple steps further. Again, uh, opening of the third movement of the Dvorak. Hopefully, you guys have all got it. You could either have click, 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 or you could choose a way of counting that reflects the, the character of the music. And it will affect your cueing and your breathing. So maybe we can just play the first couple phrases. that um, and actually we use this sometimes in rehearsal we actually reduce the music to counting out loud the numbers one two three four in this case not only to make sure that one of us isn't counting one two three and someone else is counting one two three because that might not be so obvious when you're playing but it's very obvious when we're talking it also allows when you reduce it to counting examining the structure the bones um, through the pulse, how you're shaping things, you can hear if we're all four unanimously doing it, or one person's doing it more and someone else is being kind of passive and laid back. Um, you can uh, start to enjoy the ebb and flow of things. You can start to enjoy how big your dynamics are. We'll do a really quick example of this. Let's count those first two phrases together and then play one more time. Well, that raises <laughs> another interesting thing. Okay. If, this is if some people subdivide and some people don't subdivide, you're also going to be in trouble. Okay, so there's a lot of things that happen when you count. All right, so I was going one and was two and twice as fast. Yeah, <laughs> so that would that would be something. I was like, wait, are we feeling an eighth notes? Or are we feeling a quarter note? So we kick him out of the group. <laughs> Say, no, to be talk, honest, no, we yeah. talk about it. <laughs> So 
sounds like a seance, but it's not really. But you can really, by looking at your part and listening to how someone is shaping from beat to beat, it gives you an awareness to the way that the, the structure, the bones, are contributing to the shape of the music, which is the most fundamental way that it should happen. Let's try playing that much again. So when we play, I'm counting inside. Just the same, just not saying it out loud. sophisticated experience. It's way more than saying the words one, two, three, four, and keeping good time. Um, for example, there I'm noticing, because I'm the cellist especially, you're very much clocking when the harmonies change as opposed to when the beats change. So there the harmonies only change once every four counts, once every bar. So even though I may be counting one, two, three, four, I'm at the same time aware of one, Two, three. So I'm counting, at the same time, I'm counting four beats per bar. I'm counting one beat per count and counting four bars at a time. Does that make any sense? And that's how you begin to hear phrases, for example. You hear more clearly the relationship of chord to chord, how much harmonic tension there is in a chord. And all of those things added together help you shape the phrase. And if everyone is counting that way, you're the quartet will just move together. The ensemble, will, it feels completely united. Um, rhythm is huge, so. Specifically, there will be different things in your parts, obviously. Um, so in this particular melody, there's actually quite a bit of detail. So if you have this, these bigger rhythmic shapes, it helps direct you in where, what places you might take time and what places you shouldn't take if you see interesting details in your parts. So right, I only change notes once every bar, but the fiddles and fill too are changing notes much more often. So they have to coordinate all that melodic activity with the counting. So um, if our counting were not coordinated, none of that would sound like it belonged together. When we say counting also, it's, it's a maybe a better word is actually just a, a feeling of pulse, an inner sense of pulse. I'm not counting one, two, three, four while I'm playing. Right. Uh, but I don't think any of us are. But but we're feeling some sort of pulse underneath. Yeah. It's, it's, it's essential to the music is, I mean, pulse is a great word for it because that's is our lifeblood, literally, when you're alive, breathing and your heart beating. So the exact same thing happens within music. It's what keeps the music alive. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit also about cohesive playing from the point of view of, of the actual things you do on your instrument, too. Um, so one huge area of, the, of interest for string players especially, so any pianists here, just sort of take note, be glad you don't have to deal with this, although you have plenty of other things to deal with, like playing a million notes uh, and absorbing it all, and you're being able to play multiple voices and this finger and that finger. Anyways, you guys have your own issues, but one very important issue for any other player is playing in tune. Um, playing in tune is a skill that, as Phil said, all these things, by the way, we're talking about today, we, we do it as much today as the first day we rehearse. So I know all you guys are about to get ready to rehearse your chain music pieces. You will do them today, I mean, later today when you rehearse, and tomorrow, and the next day, and next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. So, um, and playing in tune never gets any easier, I'll tell you that, on a string instrument. Um, we practice it every day. Um, uh, one important thing about playing in tune on a string instrument is to realize that you're never, no note is in tune all by itself. It's compared to what's around it. So both the melodic notes that happen before and after, and of course in a string quartet or any other ensemble, how you hear relating to, so, uh, to the people around you. So, for example, it's impossible to, for us in, in quartet to say, um, Robin, you are out of tune there. It's not really that way. It's like we're not hearing the same pitch, core. So I wanted to show you how our quartet works on intonation when we have patches that are like, oh, I'm a little out of sync there. Um, the, Phil talked earlier about there being a foundation. I think intonation-wise, the foundation is often the bass instrument. Um, 
And then when you build things, there's a physics, physical reason, physics reason, acoustical reason why this is the case, the overtone series, we won't get into that today. But, um, but if it's an easy way to hear, if you can hear, if you're happy with where the bass note is, then it's easier to hear if you relate well to that. And if everyone relates well to the bass, it tends to really pull the intonation together. So I'll, we'll give an example of like the first chord of this. Um, in, in, our, in our group, um, I allow them to criticize my bass note anytime they like. But once they like it, then it's their responsibility to play well with it, okay? <laughs> so that's how it works. So this opening chord is an F major chord. It's actually a surprisingly hard chord to tune for string quartets, F major. So assuming like they like it, and I'm actually listening for that, a, that open A string. That's a, a sort of a key to getting the F where they like it. I just know that. So after that, after they like my half, and I, I will, so uh, let me back up a second too. We don't do this for like every note of the whole piece. We'll find a chord that we're like a little unhappy with and we'll try and tune that. And in the process of tuning a chord here and there, hoping that a rising tide floats all boats. And it's true, the more you listen on an individual chord, the more it is t easy to hear everything as it's going by. So say we started this movement and we were a little kind of funky. Let's tune that opening chord. Here's what we'll do. So, find my F. If they're happy with it, then we will look for any other perfect interval to, ma to match it to. So, octaves, chiefly, first of all. And we got it. Jazz got an F. So, she will, and, and I'll play it loud enough that she can play quite strongly and have it feel like her sound is disappearing inside my sound at the same time. She can play both loud, and it sounds both loud and soft at the same time. So S first, then we look for C's because that's a fifth. That's Phil. Again, the same thing. Where he can, when he can play quite loudly and it sounds soft at the same time, you know that the overtones are matching up. The reason why, by the way, the technical reason why the F major chord is so hard to play in tune is because viola's got low C string and it's hard to play my F with, that's in tune with his C string and the A string over here at the same time. That's, it's, fun. it's a funny chord that way. But in this case, he's fingering the C, so. Then the last, the la well, first of all, so we'll get that going. The, the last notes to add when you're trying to play a triad in tune, that's the building blocks of tonal music, would be a third or possibly a seventh. And those notes are actually a little less um, sort of like a, uh, non-negotiable in a way. Like the fifths and the octaves, they're either there or they're not. It sounds like totally true. But the thirds and sevenths are kind of the color notes. So that's fun for Robin who's going to do that. So that's a matter of taste for Robin. Obviously he's listening like crazy still to the bass, but depending on where his note might be moving melodically or if it functions more harmonically, it might be a little different. In other words, it all, it all goes to say that intonation is not an exact science. It's an art and it's built on listening as much as anything else in music. Um, when you're rehearsing intonation, uh, I think sometimes there's a tendency to play really soft for two reasons. One is the, pa the music might be soft and you're like trying to rehearse it at the dynamic or you're trying to be a polite chamber musician and you're like, that in tune. It's really hard to hear intonation. So I suggest that when you do work on intonation, that you play mezzo forte or more. Just nice and solid with good core, even if the passage eventually will be soft, uh, so that you can actually hear intonation. It's hard to hear if you're all fuzzy and all being polite. Um, so let's leave intonation for there, although it's a big topic and we could discuss it longer and practice it obviously more. Um, there are other things which make playing in a group sound cohesive. Um, when there are parallel things happening in different instruments, or even, not even simultaneously, but even in sequence, like one person does something and then you hear it echoed in another person's part and then passed to another person's part. If there is not good listening going on and people don't hear, for example, the articulation the same way, or the tonal intensity the same way, um, on a string instrument that will be communicated by like how much bow you're using or how much vibrato you're using, um, it, well, it just sounds like people having a conversation who are not really listening to what the other person is talking about. 
Okay, <laughs> and that doesn't it doesn't it just doesn't sound right when uh, when the piece is meant to be one logical f flow of thought played by four people, and that doesn't happen. So um, that requires good attention to what everyone ar else around you is doing. And by the way, so string players, when you're playing with a pianist, for example, to pay attention to the way the pianist is articulating something that you're about to play. It, c it could mean that you're going to play something a little differently in order to sound like you're related to the piano than you would have otherwise, and vice versa. Um, I always find, for example, that um, hearing a staccato on a piano, a short note, has a totally different energy sometimes than the way I would do it instinctively on a string instrument. So I feel like I learn a lot by playing with other people and hearing the sounds that come out of their instruments. And same thing with wind, if you play with wind instruments. They articulate things naturally differently. So. Um, hearing, hearing how a short note is played or how a connected note is played. Pianist, on the other hand, to play with a string player who sings through a, a melody, you can learn a lot by listening to that and trying to sort of um, make sure that, that that happens in the same way. Um, anything else you guys want to add about cohesive play? Um, I can say the, the way I like to work on intonation in a group is uh, we don't generally stop so much and totally break down a chord unless it's a real disaster. Um, <laughs> but what sometimes work is, works is just to play a bit slower, still with character, still with quality, so that you can see a little bit clearer, or you can hear a little bit clearer. It's like instead of being a high-speed train with things flying by, if it's going slower, you can see the details. Um, and if you're still playing with the uh, quality, if everybody's still playing with quality and, and character, um, you can hear what you'd like intonation to sound like in context, um, which is really important. Um, so that's another way to do it. Let's move on to yes. um, inter uh, working on interpretation and using a score. Uh, so we, uh, some of you may be more conscientious, of, uh, conscientious about this than others, but definitely get a score from the first rehearsal if you can. And the music office can help you get a score if you don't have one. Um, just go to them and say, we, we need a score to this piece. Really important that you have a score for a couple of reasons. One is you have to know how your part functions with everyone else. Very difficult if, um, for, even, even just in terms of ensemble, if, you, if th something's not together, to sort it out, to say, oh, I see, you have 16ths there, all right, we'll, we'll figure out how to mesh this all together. Um, but it also really helps in terms of, um, now we'll get into interpretation of how you play your part. Did you want to do the, that um, demonstration of the return of the melody? Uh, sure. So here's, we'll go back to the slow moment of the Dvorak, and here's the, the opening melody. Let's, for example, pay attention, uh, for now, uh, to Robin's melody. So I, I wouldn't, uh, it's, it would actually be very difficult, I think, for me to play, to play it the same way um, as the first time. Because of everything that they're doing, it has a completely different uh, feel. It's very peaceful at the beginning, and then it's very playful this time. Um, and, and he even gives me a few different notes to, to emphasize that. Um, but it's... My, my way of playing it the second time is really dependent on what they're doing. Um, and, and this line, this almost silly little line that the, the second, I mean, it's great, <laughs> that the second violinist has, um, lends so much spice uh, and character to uh, the whole and makes me play in a, in a 
different way um, because of how they're playing. Uh, not just because I have some notes written here and some slurs and maybe a tranquilo or something, um, which I do have, but uh, it's by listening and knowing what other people have that uh, allows me to choose an interpretation that fits. So look, look, looking at a score and the reason why it's important for me is it sort of reinforces or clarifies what my ears are telling me. We could do, we could play a passage like that and go, oh, oh Dave and Phil are playing pizzicato and jazz playing fast notes. And that should give him plenty of information. But when you see it as well, it can totally reinforce that. And also, here's the big thing for me with a score. Seeing something in a score allows me to ask more intelligent questions. So Robin could, uh, could also ask, like, what are you guys doing over there? Pizzicato, <laughs> like, I mean, and who knows what he means by that. But um, <laughs> the, one, the, thing that I, the reason why I want to know what's going on is because I want to know, why did Dvorak write Pizzicato? I want to know, why did Dvorak write Forte? I want to know, why did he write the staccato here? And if you guys get in the habit of, anytime you look at a score, not, uh, not just observing, oh, we're supposed to see a staccato, we're supposed to play short. Oh, there's piano, we're supposed to play softly. But if you always ask yourself, why is that there? I think then you are turning over the stone to this mysterious thing, like how do you interpret a piece of music? To me, interpreting a piece of music means finding my own personal meaning in it. And that process comes when I ask why that is there. Thinking like as if I were Dvorak in a way. Like, I mean, obviously I'm not. And obviously he's not even here to ask him what he thought. So, but I want to know like, wh why did he make the chords move so slowly at the beginning? Um, not just observe that he did. Oh, okay, well, well the chords are going to sound incredibly tranquil and drawn out. And that will make me do things differently, uh, differently on my instrument. Pizzicato, why is it there? To sound, it sounds playful. Okay, I mean, because I can do a pizzicato that's not playful, too. Um, so it will, it will help me understand what I think of the music, asking that simple question, why? Also, it makes it way more fun to play a piece, because I remember having um, some coachings and maybe some rehearsals where it was like, oh, you didn't do that piano. Oh, you're a little faster than 56 there. Oh, now you didn't observe that staccato. And I kind of got like both mad at myself for not doing it, and also like kind of like frustrated. And I'm like, is that all this is? Playing music is following a bunch of directions, and then occasionally being called out because I'm wrong. Um, that's not fun. Um, fun is discovering why this piece means something to me, and then hopefully getting that to come out in my, my music making. So I think looking at a score and listening to each other's parts will make music mean much, much, can make music mean much, much more to you. You can, you can start with the biggest details. Like, why is it allegro? Or why is it allegro molto? Or why is it allegro ma non troppo? Why, why did the composer decide to write the tempo marking that they chose? Okay, I see it starts forte. Oh, but I see there's a fortissimo over here. And I see there's a triple forte there. All right, why? What does that mean? Why? Why are those? Why does that? Why did he want that louder than this? Yeah. Um, so you can start with the the biggest details, um, and then start to notice more and more little details. And that's what's helpful for me with a score. Is every time I look at one, I notice something that I never noticed before. I think I know a piece, and then I see, wow, look, look, the the accents there, but not there. Was that intentional? Was he looking for, even though it looks kind of like the same music and there should be an accent, but then the composer decided not to write an accent. So should I, should I try to reflect that? Should there be more emphasis right there and suddenly no emphasis there? What does that sound like? Looking at a score can just be a huge time saver too. So you can compare, say, that very first phrase that we played and then when it comes back and you can just very quickly see all the differences and then it leads you, I think, down a, a road um, to quicker decisions. Also along the lines of interpretation, um, every, every marking in a part um, is, is something I think that we as musicians have to interpret. So if you see a slur, it's not that you just keep your bow moving while you move your fingers, right? Um, it's that he wanted to group some notes together and make a gesture out of them. That's why he put a slur there. Um, or or something along those lines. Or if there's a forte in the part, does that just mean you play loud? 
Um, I think, well, the volume level of a dynamic is a secondary quality, actually. I think the, the primary quality is some sort of character um, and, um, or emotion. And that's your first thing to try to determine from the music, is what, what sort of character or emotion uh, makes sense here. And the amount of sound that you use uh, is a byproduct of that. It's not the first thing. So we don't just play loud because we see a forte. Um, because just the same way as in speaking, um, how loud or soft I speak doesn't change really how you feel about my voice. It's the tone of voice. Um, and it's the way I speak um, that uh, if, I, if I sound angry, if I sound happy, um, that, those are the things that actually affect us. So you can go through a piece and play your mezzo pianos slightly less than your mezzo fortes, which are slightly less than your fortes, and be incredibly accurate and get nothing from it um, if you're only just making volume levels. Um, those are very secondary. So if you can really try to see beyond, or if you see an accent, does it just mean you hit a note? Um, if I see an accent, if I just hit it harder than I would a note without an accent, does that actually make the music sound better? Probably not. <laughs> I need to, if I see an accent, I need to somehow play it in a way that I think makes the music sound even better than if it weren't there. Um, or why would the composer do that? Well, you try to figure out some way of accomplishing it. Um, is it an accent that's down or or what sort of thing makes sense. And depending on the context, uh, any one of these types of accents might be what you're looking for. Um, but you have to be sort of like a detective. Um, and you have to be able to look beyond just the print on the page. Well, let, uh, let me just add one, one, something that starts off very basic, and that is balance. A score will confirm for you. Sometimes it's pretty clear, sometimes it's not very clear. Sometimes we have to go to the score and say, wait a minute. What do you want to hear in, in this spot? Uh, and uh, the, the, where it gets more, so it's not only identifying the leading line, the secondary line, or maybe at a certain point when it comes back, what was the melody, maybe we m will make a decision. Well, actually, you know, it comes back, Robin's still playing the main line, but Jen has an even more interesting line. You can make a decision like that. And then where it gets pretty sophisticated, is bringing out a line, you can make choices there. It's not like, you play loud, I'll play soft. There are many, many ways to project a line. More vibrato, less vibrato. Um, a heavier sound, a lighter sound. A darker sound, a more transparent sound. Uh, you can get very sophisticated about making balances and not just louder and softer. Yeah, oftentimes you find that if you have very precise ways of playing all the different parts, um, that each one has its own, li like you said, lightness or heaviness or articulation or lack of articulation, um, you can get all the things to be heard rather than the main line plays loudly and the other things play less. Um, and then you, you, get, you might be able to hear the main line then, but it, it might kind of sound muddy and not very interesting. But if everybody plays very specifically, you actually get everything to be heard. Uh, which is better. Yes, <laughs> definitely. We like everything to be heard. Um, well, actually, this sort of everything being heard leads us in a great way to the final topic, which is actually really important. So I hope you, I mean, I hope up until now, you guys have like a nice laundry list of things you can discuss, even from the, your very first rehearsal and playthrough, or listen for, or think about as you guys are rehearsing your pieces starting this afternoon. But I want to say that without this last topic that we're going to talk about, that all the productivity you could have, everything we talk about for the first 45 minutes, will go out the window. I guarantee it. And that has to do with not only what you talk about in discussing a rehearsal, but how you discuss it. Um, so one of the things that I personally love about playing string quartet, I try to remind myself of this on a regular basis um, because it's kind of the key f for me to enjoying music and to understanding more about myself as a musician. 
is that when it comes to deciding things about music or figuring things out, I have a very important secret weapon that Yo-Yo Ma does not have. I have three other people with me all the time who think as deeply about music as I do, who care about it as much as I do, um, who play it as beautifully as I ever could, and they're with me every time we put, make music together. I find that in quartet, the more I understand about how they think about music, the more complete it makes me. Robin talked about how playing his melody the second time, the way he understood it was because of what we we're doing. Um, and in fact, if you were just practicing, if you were just practicing his part alone, and he played the same melody, it's like, oh, it's like the beginning. Play it again, and maybe I'll try and make it even more beautiful. I'll try a slide here. But not that the fundamental quality, character of it could have been expanded. And that's like when you meet someone who's surprised you in some way, and all of a sudden you discover something about yourself, some quality about yourself that you never knew you had. Um, say you met someone who just loved telling jokes all the time, and you're like, I was kind of a ser serious kid when I was little. And, um, and then all of a sudden I was like, wow, it's so fun to tell jokes or making puns or something. And then you started thinking about puns all the time. And all of a sudden you discovered something about yourself because you met this person. That's what playing chamber music has the possibility of being, of collaborating has the possibility of being, is that you become a larger person with bigger thoughts and more diverse thoughts and amazing thoughts because of what you get around you. So I, the reason why I try to think of that all the time because I think that very much affects how we work as a group together and especially since we are in this for the long haul, how we're gonna work two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now too, okay? Because if you're slightly annoyed by someone, like in one rehearsal, I'll tell you by the 10th rehearsal, you'll be more annoyed. And <laughs> one year later, you'll be even more annoyed. And then five years later, you're like, eh, I don't think we need to do this anymore. Um, so the idea that I can come into a rehearsal and learn more about, not just about these guys, but about myself through their eyes and ears, is kind of a fundamental way of thinking to me of not only my continued growth as a musician, but also our continued growth as a group uh, over years and years, not just from rehearsal to rehearsal, but that will happen too. Um, so what that means practically for me is I come to rehearsal more curious to know what they think about music than trying to impose what I think about a piece. Um, I think by my playing, if I've already made some decisions about how I'm going to play, they're going to know what I think about the piece anyway. So for me to come in, and especially with my words, say, um, guys, we need to go slower here, and uh, you need to be a little softer here, and then I think it's going to work out great. Um, a much better way for me to come into rehearsal, because I'm probably, hopefully, going to play that way already, would be like, Robin, what, what, what do you think about that for today? What, what was your idea about that, that detail there? Or what do you guys, what do all you guys think about the way we're pacing this phrase? If, what's the, what, what do you guys think about character? Does it feel too active here? Or what, 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 what do you hear in the music? If, if I ask more questions of these guys than make um, suggestions, <laughs> and that would be putting it nicely, because sometimes it's not even phrased as a suggestion. Sometimes it's like, well, you should do this, right? Um, that's not even a suggestion, in my opinion. That's a command. Um, you know, that might be work well with your pet dog. Doesn't really work well with fellow <laughs> collaborators in music. Um, so there are very, I think, just basic ways that you can express yourself, even verbally, but in a way that invites and engages other people in your group. And it's a way more fun way to make music when, when you feel that way. They will also, you'll find that when you're that way, they'll give the same energy back to you. And there's nothing I enjoy more than playing Souvenir to Florence with Robin and hearing him create in a phrase and having me have to go like, wow, that was beautiful. I hope I can do it just as beautifully, but in my own way, you know what I mean? That's what playing chamber music is all about. It's like being inspired by the things you hear around you. Um, and that starts with your general attitude towards what's available, the resources are Say. I think that's Sorry to monopolize. Yeah, that was, Since I talked about like welcoming others into the conversation, I monopolized that one a lot. Yeah, but I think, but I think um, one of the powerful, powerful results of, of coming in with that mindset is that you will automatically communicate respect to the others. 
you will show them that you want to know what they think and that you value what they think and that when they give you an idea, you'll actually try it rather than shoot it down or try it badly. <laughs> it's easy to do. And <laughs> maybe you know what I'm talking about. It's fun. Um, but there are other ways, um, I mean, and there are other ways if you come in with this mindset of, of respecting each other and wanting to learn from each other um, that come out uh, practical ways. Making sure you, if you say we're going to rehearse at a certain time that you remember <laughs> to show up and that you show up on time and that you show up prepared and that even between rehearsals it, it, it's, it's clear that you worked on certain spots that you had talked about or maybe you, you couldn't quite get yet that you make a little progress between rehearsals because you respect the others and you want to come more prepared the next time than you were each time. So there, there are a lot of um, little ways of communicating respect. And that, that mindset is, is, I think, fundamental to keeping a group together. You guys are together for three weeks. Um, but if you were ever in a professional ensemble that were together for years, the level of respect, whether it's built or eroded, really uh, is obvious after uh, actually not very long. Another, another way I, I, I think is uh, really helpful for me to think about being in chamber music is thinking about the balance between an individual voice and what you want to say with conviction. You're the only one playing your part, um, but that ultimate success is making everyone sound good. I can't sound good at the expense of someone else because we won't be successful together. Uh, it's, uh, it changes then the way I talk to the others, the way I take ideas, the way I give ideas. It's not about making me the smartest or I figured out the right interpretation. It's like, what will help all of us sound better? And if I put out an idea and, it, and we try it and it doesn't work very well, I shouldn't be so <laughs> eager to be like, no, no, we have to do that idea. I mean, we, maybe we can try it a few times, but if it's not working, I should give up. I say, it's not, it doesn't work, it doesn't work today. Maybe you know tomorrow things will be a little different. You can come at it another way, but um, you know, <laughs> let go of things pretty quickly and move on and, and see 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 if others can contribute um, to make uh, bring out the best in each other. It's it's that's a skill that <laughs> unfortunately our society is not very good at right now. It seems like everyone is more eager to say what they think than making um, making other people better. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. <laughs> and so if we can learn as chamber musicians to make each other better rather than just shouting our opinions, we'll have learned a lot. Um, one of the fun things about this festival and all of you coming from the far corners of the globe together, all of you bring so many interesting points of music, view about music and background. You all have different teachers back home, different experiences. And to sit and make music together, you, you all are in for a fantastic experience. So well, one, one thing about these guys, well, I respect them completely. I play with them every day. And I enjoy, also, I, while I enjoy that, I also enjoy the sp spaces we all do when we play with other people because all of a sudden it's more fresh stuff um, in our ears. So um, I just was playing at another festival before here where I was playing with not these guys but other people. And it's always just so interesting. I miss them because I couldn't play as in tune as well as I can with these guys because we listen to each other all the time. But um, um, as far as new musical ideas and personalities and thoughts, that's great. And that's what a festival like this is going to be so wonderful for you all about. I hope you get that in the next three or six weeks. Um, I think we, uh, uh, I would love to have a couple, time for a couple of questions. We've got four minutes, if, unless there's something important you guys want to add to that. Does anyone have a question or a comment? Um, you may have a lot more in a few days after you start playing. Yeah. Uh, back to the intonation. That sounds to me like it's a uh, real time intonation. You can try to push back to that at this time and try to pull back. That seems fine. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, really quickly, in a minute, uh, uh, um, string players and wind players. Intonation. Uh, so there are a couple ways practically to work on it. Um, if it's suitable, hold, someone holding a drone note, you guys all know playing against a drone note is very helpful. Um, playing a little bit slower, as Robin was talking about, but playing four bars at a time a little slower and committing to, to a, a slower tempo but a steady tempo. 
because that gets really confusing if someone hears something and then they stop and they start trying to fix it and other people are going on. Because uh, intonation. Is, but, oh, sorry, is that what you're talking about, or you're talking about making something stick? Like the next day, how do you do it? I'm getting it. Practice one. I'm getting it. Okay, sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. So I didn't realize the answer was so comprehensive. Yeah, no, I just I just wanted to give them some practical ways of working intonation because what happens is if you work in these ways in a really concentrated ten minutes at a time until people get tired or frustrated, you'll find that your intonation in general gets better because intonation is, I would say, 90% your ears and only 10% where you actually put your fingers. Your ears guide where you put your fingers. So the better your ears get, it's cumulative. And you don't have to go through every single bar of a piece before you start playing the whole thing better because you start to hear your intonation. I think, I think that's the ultimate answer is your ears get better and then it sticks. I, I try and remember, like if we tune to F major chord, I try to remember what that feels and sounds like in, a, in, in this group. And it feels different in different groups when you play with different people. I try and, rem I try and remember that, like literally mem remember the feeling and the sound of that. Um, and then hopefully you hit the chord, like says, Phil says, the next day and you're closer to what that is and you keep doing that and you start remembering more and more and like, yeah, that's the, that's the sound, that's the feeling. Another question? Like I said, I bet you have a lot more questions after you start playing some together. Jan. Uh, I enjoyed the book too, last night very much. But I know that piece from an old Emerson recording 25 years ago. Do we still need a measure? <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I, I, I wonder, how do you guys decide how do you want the piece to sound? Is it all of these little decisions and then it sounds that way or do you have a concept for it? You know, the, the Emerson seem to emphasize the angles, the corners, and the harshness. And, you know, subtlety here, but your music flowed more and was a little more melodic to my ear. Um, part of that is kind of personal style, but uh, you're right. I think uh, an overall feeling is the accumulation of many small decisions. Um, and whether those decisions are verbalized amongst us or we just, I mean, we try to make as many of our decisions not verbal, to be honest. Our best rehearsals are, are when we talk the least. And we just hear, okay, Robin hears this in this phrase, so I'm gonna try that. And then if there's some confusion, we're like, oh, I can't make that work so well, then we start, then we talk a little bit. Or if I, I don't feel like I understand something that I hear. But we, we do have, I think we are going for an overall feeling. Yeah. Um, and, and, and in the Prokofiev, for instance, I think one of the elements that we're trying to base our interpretation on is the folk-like element, and that he, he, he spent some time in the Carpathian region, and uh, some of these things are based on folk tunes. And, and I feel like much of the piece has a sort of peasant-like element. It's not, it's not overly sophisticated, um, but it's also joyful, I think, and it's not Soviet, <laughs> in, in my opinion. I think that's, maybe that's the difference between uh, what maybe what you're hearing in, in an Emerson recording or something is that um, I don't think of it as Soviet music. I think of it more as folk music. So that overarching sort of idea probably steers us in a very different direction. I don't hear industry. Um, I like thinking of folk music as singing and dancing. Yeah. That's the, those are the two things that we all kind of will do without, I would watch my kids make music without prompting. They dance and they sing. That's kind of what it's about, so. I, I think you're right though, and this is what would happen with all of you, is looking at the score and asking those questions and there will be different things that pop out of the score to, to different you, people. To different yeah. people. Right. So for the Emerson, I'm sure they went through the same process as we did. You look at it and they might have said, wow, look at all that, the, the, the way those lines hop around and the jagged quality. Let's try to bring that out and that's kind of what fascinates them or about Or they it. wanted the, the, the edge of the dissonance or something like yeah. that, you know? So that will happen with each of you and your interpretation will be, become you. Uh, one last question right here. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to keep it really good. Going along with it, One issue I have with my students is just getting them to listen to music. Can you maybe speak a moment about, like, I think young classical musicians need to have favorite artists and need to listen to albums and kind of let the hours go by and how they play. They need to engage in listening. What are your thoughts about that? 
guess. I, I, yeah. I, I really <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I um, mean, I was just talking about this with. Uh, oh, so one of our artist faculty this this uh, session. I'm so happy he's here. Sierra's Earl Carlos. He's the former second mouse of the Juilliard Quartet, and he said, I, "I remember your." He was our coach, one of our coaches when we were in the early stages of our quartet. And he remembered the piece that he coached us on, the Debussy Quartet. And I said, well, uh, uh, the reason why you remember it is because we learned it by listening to your recording of it. We, 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 and then I was thinking about our, our LPs that we grew up listening to. It's, it was a different seeking out music in, these, in those days. Because, uh, you know, you had to go to the record store and buy something. Now it's so accessible that I think it's almost too easy in a way, and so then it's, you kind of take it for granted a little bit, maybe, how easy it is to listen to music. Um, but I, I, I totally agree with you. I think what, I mean, and it has to do with, again, what I'm talking about, like what goes into my ears gives me the possibility of what can come out when it's mixed with my imagination. So the more things I can hear, whether it's a piece that I know played by someone I've never heard play it, or a piece I've never heard, or a style of music I've never heard, those are, th those are the things that kind of, that's my education. That's my, the food for my imagination. And so I think for any musician, whether you're a student or been playing for decades like me, it's, that's, what we, that's what we live for, it's, you know, that musical food. So, agree. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming, and especially to all our participants, many happy hours of making music together in the next few weeks. So. Thank you.